To introduce the Foreign Minister, let me welcome the Vice-Chancellor of the ANU, Professor Brian Schmidt. Thank you, Shiro, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet today, pay our respects to the elders of the Noonawal people, past, present, and emerging on this campus. Ambassador Kasaka, uh, former ambassador and chair of the Australian Japan Foundation, Murray McLean, friends, colleagues, and of course, the foreign minister. We're delighted to be here today to welcome you all to the ANU and to the Japan Update, our flagship event on Japan each year. I am proud that we are able to host such important gathering each year that brings experts uh, from the nation's university and indeed around the world. And uh, we also have the ability to take this update around Australia. Uh, this year, we'll be uh, going to Perth as well, after Melbourne and Sydney in the past two years. ANU has a long history of engagement with Japan and our Asian neighbors, joint research, close collaboration, and in shaping policy such as the work that led to the creation of APEC, and you'll see Peter Drysdale back there, and by educating the next generation of leaders in our region. We will continue to attract the best students and researchers because we invest in our Asian expertise. It is important for the nation and it's important for the National University to have this role. And as I said, we will continue to do this because it is one of our major strengths and our ma major contributions to the nation. ANU has the largest collection of Asian specialists in the English speaking world. And we value that and value opportunities like this to communicate our research and the latest uh, thinking to the public with our friends and colleagues from Japan. And so without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce the Honorable Julie Bishop, the Minister for Foreign Affairs and Deputy Leader of the Liberal Party. Minister Bishop is no stranger to ANU or Japan, and it is fitting that she is here today to elevate what is already one of the highlights on our ANU calendar. So, without further ado, Minister Bishop. Good morning. I'm delighted to be here, the fifth annual Japan Update with such a distinguished audience. And I acknowledge Japanese Ambassador Sumio Kusaka, Vice Chancellor Brian Schmidt, thank you for the introduction, and Chair of the Australia Japan Foundation, Murray McLean, a great friend of Japan. I also make particular mention of Professor Peter Drysdale, who has done so much throughout his career to deepen our understanding of Japan and of the regional economy. Ladies and gentlemen, five years ago, I addressed the first Japan update over dinner, which was attended by then J Bank of Japan Governor Masaki Shirakawa. And it is fitting that the Bank of Japan Chief Economist Toshitaka Sakin is here to address the audience today. The Japan Update has become the peak academic gathering on Japan and the event has increased in profile and relevance each time it's been held. And this gathering does represent ANU's deep expertise on Japan and the university's ability to draw the best thinkers on Japan from both our countries to deepen the level of collaboration. It also serves as an important forum to advance our appreciation for developments in the Japanese economy, Japanese society, politics, and foreign relations. The discussions during the Japan Update are important and deserve to be publicised and disseminated widely. And it is notable that the issue of the East Asia Forum Quarterly is dedicated to Japan with themes and topics based on Japan update each year. <coughs> Good foreign policy is never formulated in a vacuum. It is made better by the collective efforts of and debates amongst experts and commentators, including those who are here today. I'm particularly pleased that several of the speakers on the program will visit Western Australia and bring the update to my home city of Perth later this week. 
with our friend Ambassador Kusaka in attendance, I take the opportunity to acknowledge the important support that Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has given to the ANU in the study and understanding of Japan when he visited Canberra in 2014. And during that visit, Prime Minister Abe announced a million dollar program to support Australia-Japan Research Centre, which is enhancing policy development and collaboration between the two countries. And this is on top of the earlier investment that both governments and business communities made in the 1980s to establish the centre. One initiative of note is the collaborative effort between the centre and the Japanese government and academics to develop a HEX-style income contingent loan scheme in Japan, and I know Brian is particularly involved in that initiative. This is just one example of the policy innovation in education that is occurring between our two countries. Australia-Japan relations celebrate a significant milestone this year. 2017 marks the 60th anniversary of the Commerce Agreement between our two countries. The relatively simple title of Commerce Agreement doesn't do justice to its importance. What may appear today to be an uncontroversial event in the history of our bilateral relations was anything but six decades ago. In 1957, the Commerce Agreement had fierce critics. The decision to normalise trade between our two countries took political and moral courage. The tumultuous events of the 1940s were still fresh in the minds of populations in both countries. However, the Australian government, led by Sir Robert Menzies, and the Japanese government, led by Prime Minister Kishi, were determined to look to the future and not to be constrained by the past. It was a visionary act that had an extraordinary impact on our nations. The agreement became the cornerstone of the strong bilateral partnership between our two countries. It formalised and entrenched the shift toward Japan as an important export market and source for manufactured imports. Rarely do acts of courage by political leaders pay such handsome dividends so soon after. Just one decade after its signing, an economically rising Japan overtook the United Kingdom to become Australia's largest export market, while Australians became accustomed and wanted cheaper and high quality Japanese goods. Japan remains one of our largest trading partners and is the fourth largest source for foreign direct investment into Australia. So the simply named Commerce Agreement was not just ahead of its time in a bilateral sense. Japan was then in the middle of pioneering the aptly named East Asian model of rapid economic development based on attracting foreign capital into one's economy, producing or else assembling exports cheaper, efficiently and more reliably than competitors, and developing the know-how and the entrepreneurial spirit domestically in the process. Subsequently, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Thailand and the Philippines all adopted similar approaches. More recently, China has learned and benefited enormously from Japan's experience. <laughs> India, Indonesia and Myanmar are destined to do the same. Since the late 1950s, we've witnessed the largest and most rapid alleviation of poverty in human history throughout our region. When we signed the 1957 agreement, East Asia and Australia accounted for approximately 10% of global GDP. Our region now accounts for around 27% of global GDP, and that could be as high as 40% in a decade's time. Having been a regular visitor to Japan as foreign minister, I'm also invested in the Australia-Japan economic relationship in a rather more personal way. In February, I visited Goji in South Korea to inspect the $43 billion ICTHUS LNG project, which is the largest ever overseas investment by a Japanese firm. During that visit, I was honoured to be named the godmother of the ICTHUS Explorer <laughs> Central Processing Facility. Now, this is the largest 
semi-submersible structure in the world, an enormous 130 metres by 120 metres. Now, that is some godchild. <laughs> the construction phase alone created more than 10,000 Australian jobs. The Ichthus Explorer now sits some 220 kilometres off the West Australian coast and will be managed by Inpex from Perth. When fully operational, the Ichthus LNG project will produce up to 8.9 million tonnes of liquefied natural gas with 70% sold on long-term contracts to boost Japan's energy security. And so this project is a great example of how governments, firms and individuals from our two countries work together for our collective greater <coughs> wellbeing. Our two countries have learned how best to grow our respective economies through two-way trade and investment. Deepening economic relations goes hand in hand with greater respect for rules and international law, without which trust and transparency between countries is not possible. Australia and Japanese voices in the region matter greatly and are especially important at the present time. <coughs> The case for the international rules-based order needs to be made and remade at a time when alternative approaches or instances where international law is being ignored are on the rise. This order is one designed to protect the rights of larger and smaller countries alike. It does not predetermine the winners of the international system or entrench advantages for the privileged few. The order regulates competition and protects nations from coercion and intimidation by stronger powers. It allows nations to legitimately advance their interests and resolve disagreements amicably whenever they arise. Japan's remarkably <coughs> peaceful and prosperous rise after the Second World War is a constant reminder that the international rules-based order is worth preserving. Japan has become our closest Asian strategic partner. As allies of the United States, we are both vocal champions of the liberal rules-based order as the foundation for peaceful development and greater prosperity. We elevated our bilateral relationship to that of special strategic partners in 2014. I meet regularly with my counterpart, first Foreign Minister Kishida and now Foreign Minister Kono, to discuss ways that we can pursue our interests and support the region's common objectives. Our conversations are always warm and frank and constructive. In Manila last month and on the sidelines of the East Asia Summit Foreign Ministers meeting, I met with Secretary of State Rex Tillerson and Foreign Minister Kono during our annual trilateral security dialogue to discuss how our three nations could best approach challenges in our region. And these challenges are substantial and the Prime Minister and I have been in recent contact with our Japanese counterparts to discuss the behaviour of North Korea, its illegal missile and nuclear programs and the threat they pose to Japan, the Republic of Korea, our allies and friends in our region. and the threat to peace and stability. And of course, it was brought into even sharper focus this week following Pyongyang's sixth illegal and most powerful nuclear test, which continues its history of defiance of UN Security Council resolutions and international law. Other challenges include managing maritime disputes peacefully without coercion and in accordance with international law and preventing extreme Islamic groups from gaining an enduring foothold in Asia. The agreement and understanding between our two countries in terms of meeting these challenges and the outcomes we seek are genuine. That stems from our common interests, values and the remarkably similar way our governments and people view the world. There was strong agreement that Asia cannot take economic growth for granted, including in the face of the technological revolution in automation, artificial intelligence and the internet of things that will modify how we live, work and create value, meaning economic models will change. Another important factor that Japan knows better than probably any other country is that demographic challenges from population ageing are growing and we must prepare for them. Many of these developments will be disruptive and unsettling. However, the opportunities for countries that innovate and adapt 
are considerable. As markets change and how we work and add value is modified, innovative economies with skilled people in countries with strong institutions will thrive. In periods of uncertainty and constant change, our close partnership with Japan in all matters makes even more sense. Australia and Japan are leading advocates for freer and more open trade. The economic history of this region provides compelling evidence that free and open markets generate opportunity and will lead to greater prosperity as it allows countries to focus and excel on what they do best. Even so, the reasons for continuing to open and liberate markets need to be made and remade to all our economic partners in Asia and beyond. Protectionism is not a distant problem and has argu arguably found a resurgence in some populist policy platforms. As has become common with respect to our two countries, Australia and Japan are leading the way. The Japan-Australia Free Trade Agreement came into force in January of 2015. The agreement is the most comprehensive trade agreement Japan has signed with any developed economy. As it stands, over 98% of Australia's merchandise exports to Japan are able to receive preferential access or enter duty-free. Japan's private sector can now invest up to around a billion dollars in non-sensitive Australian sectors without having to seek Foreign Investment Review Board approval. Uh, this is an increase from the $252 million threshold prior to our free trade agreement entering into force. Foreign direct investment represents a long-term bet in any particular economy. We welcome Japan making ever larger long-term investments in the Australian economy. Prime Minister Abe demonstrated immense courage and tenacity in persuading the Japanese Diet to ratify the Trans-Pacific Partnership last December. Australia and Japan are now championing the preservation of the principles underpinning the Trans-Pacific Partnership as these are the gold standard for free trade agreements and we are leading the way in exploring a framework for a TPP 11 in the region. Our bilateral relationship goes much deeper than trade and investment with growing cultural and community links. Ever-growing individual ties between Japanese and Australians are important to sustain the relationship. To give a contemporary example, around 1,500 Australian undergraduates have chosen to live, study and undertake work experience in Japan under the first four years of the government's new Colombo plan from 2014 to 2017. And I know that at least another 800 students will be studying in Japan next year under the new Colombo plan. This is a significant diplomatic and foreign policy investment in our region. For by the end of 2018, just five years since the establishment of the new Colombo Plan, over 30,000 Australian undergraduates will have lived and studied and undertaken work experience in one of 40 countries in our region. There will be powerful personal links between our young citizens and they will endure over a lifetime. We are investing in the leaders of the future and we want them to know and understand and appreciate the importance of our bilateral relationship with Japan and the importance of our place in the world, the Indian Ocean, Asia Pacific. In 2019 and 2020, millions of visitors, including from Australia, will flock to Japan for the Rugby World Cup and the Summer Olympic Games, respectively. These visitors will discover what I already know. Japan is a paradigm of a modern, successful, prosperous, vibrant and free country in Asia. With Japan and Australia as two shining examples, liberal democracy is as successful in our region as it is in North America and Europe. I trust the discussion for the rest of the day will be stimulating and productive. I congratulate the ANU for hosting this excellent event each year as both our countries benefit greatly <coughs> from the interaction. Thank you.
May I now call on Mr. His Excellency Mr. Sumio Kusaka, Ambassador of Japan. Thank you, Shiro-san. The Honourable Judy Bishop, uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs, Professor Brian Schmidt, Vice Chancellor of Australian National University. On behalf of the Japanese government, I'd like to thank Foreign Minister Ms. Judy Bishop for her excellent address. Mr. Bishop's inspiring remarks help frame uh, today's discussion and illustrate very clearly and in a very comprehensive manner and the importance of Japan Australia relations and the possible uh, directions moving forward. I, we are very much honored to have Minister Bishop in attendance, who has kindly taken time out of an extremely heavy and uh, demanding schedule. I believe the Foreign Minister's presence at Japan's update is a true testament of the Australian government's view of our relationship as critically important. We all understand that our strong relationship is more important than ever to maintain a stable and prosperous region. On the economic front, Japan and Australia are together playing a leading role in pushing for TPP 11, which is a strong pusher, pushback against the emerging protectionist currents. Our cooperation in this area is to introduce high-level trade and investment rules in the Asia-Pacific. A major milestone of cooperation in defense is our cooperative efforts to sign the reciprocal access agreement, which will contribute significantly to peace and stability in the Asia-Pacific. The security situation in the current Asia-Pacific is now quite intense and serious and demands our closest attention. North Korea's nuclear or hydrogen bomb testing and ballistic missile uh, firing are totally unacceptable. It is absolutely necessary to exert maximum pressure and impose the strongest possible sanctions against North Korea to further prevent dangerous and reckless action through uh, international solidarity, including UN Security Council resolutions. Today's Japan update looks at Japan's challenges and examines the position and role of Japan in the Asia Pacific, prominent experts with the sharpest minds from both Japan and Australia will also examine our relations and opportunities for the future. I'd like to sincerely thank all my fellow speakers, including those who have traveled here from as far as Japan. Hopefully today's discussion will be constructive and productive for the speakers and the audience. I'm very much looking forward to free and uh, frank discussion with all of you here today. Thank you very much. Okay, so we would like to start the final session in the morning. Now let me start the economics keynote session. Uh, I'm Ipe Fujiwara, professor of macroeconomics at the Austrian National University and the KO University. Uh, we are really fortunate to have a truly distinguished speaker for this session. The speaker is Dr. Toshitaka Sekine, the Director General of the Research and the Studies Department of the Bank of Japan. That is the current Chief Economist of the Bank of Japan. Um, Thickness, and thank you very much for coming here in winter despite your very busy schedule. And uh, the aim of the update is to obtain a full flown knowledge on the current policy issue in Japan, so I can say without any hesitation, we have the best speaker for this aim. So that we are really, really lucky. Am I putting uh, too much pressure on you? I hope, I hope it's not. Okay, so. Toshi graduated from the University of Tokyo in 1987 with Bachelor in Economics and started working at the Bank of Japan immediately after. While working at the Bank of Japan, Toshi obtained a Doctor of Philosophy in Economics from Oxford University. Uh, during his career, about 30 years at the Bank of Japan, Toshi spent most of his time at the Research and the Statistics Department as a researcher. 
So that is, he has been monitoring the Japanese economy as the frontline researcher at the Bank of Japan since the mid-1990s. Uh, this period almost corresponding to the so-called Japan's loss to decays. Of course, I'm not saying that Toshi is responsible for the low growth in Japan, but uh, what I would like to stress is that Toshi has a tremendous real-time knowledge, namely what has happened in the last 20 years or 30 years in Japan. Toshi also has experiences in working in international organizations such as IMF or BIS. The BIS is a bank for international settlement at the Basel. And I spent also some time in the functions for monetary policy affairs and the financial stability. And while working on, at the Bank of Japan, Toshi has published several very influential academic papers in the top academic journals. Among them, the paper about the so-called zombie rending, uh, which is published in 2003, is known as the one of the first formal academic investigations to this issue. Through today's keynote speech, we should be able to learn a lot about the current Japanese economy and policy issues from both practical versus theoretical, as well as domestic versus global perspectives. So without a further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Sekine. Um, well, this is a prime example that so inflating the reputation is much more easier than inflating the price, prices, <laughs> so which we are starting with. But anyhow, um, I would like to thank our organizer for having me today. And uh, this is my great honor indeed to be here. Um, this is all the more the case that so, um, given that, as indicated by Minister Silberg, that so, in the past, this Japan updated invited a series of ex-BOJ economists whom I really admire. Uh, these include that so, uh, former my boss, the, the former governor, uh, Shirakawa, and also that so, um, um, the last year's participant, that so, Mr. Hayakawa, uh, who used to be in my position for some years ago. So um, given that so, sort of so, uh, history here, I'm not so sure that I can deliver a speech comparable to these great guys, in a sense. Uh, but let me do my best uh, for the rest of the, well, 30 minutes or something like that. Um, in my presentation, I will talk about Japan's macroeconomic outlook. Um, in doing so, I will spend most of the time uh, on what the Japanese firms have been doing or try to do against that so very, very serious labor shortage prevailing in Japan at this moment. And, uh, and by doing so, I'd like, I hope that so, I could cast some light, shed some light on uh, what the, if there's some new economy uh, emerging in Japan, what does it look like? So that's the kind, kind of intention of my presentation. So okay, then let me just start with this slide. Okay, yeah, here you are. Um, this slide shows that so, um, forecast of the, uh, our board members. Uh, this is a medium voter thing. That so, out of nine four board members, we, I just take that so, the medium uh, of the, this forecast. And the left hand side panel is the real GDP growth, and the right hand side is consumer prices or coin is core CPI inflation. And if you look at the left hand side, uh, this is a kind of, so horizontal axis here is, as you can see here, uh, is a timing of the forecast. And, and if you see that, so for instance, that so last observation here, uh, for the year 2017, the median voter of the board member uh, revised upward the GDP growth. April is 1.6 to 1.8 percent in July. Okay, this is the last uh, observation. And likewise, if you look at the, this green line, uh, year 2018, it used to be 1.3. Now it revised up to 1.4. 
and year 2019, it's 7.7, okay? So this is a kind of real side of the picture. And if you look at the right-hand side panel, uh, nominal figure here, um, well, you can see that so we device downward, unfortunately. Um, if you can, well, oh, sorry, let me just push back here. We used to introduce 2% inflation target, something around 90, 2013. So you can easily see the pattern of our forecast, okay? At the outset, we always predict 2% in two or three years of horizon, okay? But unfortunately, <coughs> something happened and it revised down like this. And uh, I become the chief economist somewhere here, and this, it is no exception. And uh, unfortunately, again, we device down the, the nominal fee or CPM. So um, these so, pictures just show that so. Well, if you go to the real side of the equation, then Japan seems to be quite okay. But we have some struggle in the nominal side. That's a kind of bottom line of this picture, okay? So, but let me just so, follow that so, real side of the picture a little bit more. So this is a real GDP, uh, the level of the real GDP on, the, on the your left-hand side here. And uh, presumably, you might have the impression that the Japanese economy has continued to stagnate for many years. But in fact, that's the reality, or the actual figure itself is something like this. Um, well, of course, that's so, well, there is some recovery here because of the Lehman crisis. We got down here. But after that, this is continuously so recovery here. Of course, there is up and down here is um, Great East earthquake related so down here, European crisis, introduction of the consumption tax. This kind of short term so downs are here. But if you look at the whole picture, then we have continued to grow, okay? And the average growth from here to here is 1.3% per annual. And if I calculate the same thing before the Lehman crisis, here, from the two, somewhere 2000 to 2017, then again, the average growth rate is 1.3%. And remember that so, before the Lehman crisis, the global economy, including the Japanese economy, is buoyed by a lot of so, well, uh, good thing happening there, uh, new economy or these kind of things. So this picture is just showing that so after the Lehman crisis, we continue to grow. So not the public image of the stagnate or something like that. And if you look at the more detail in the recent figures, it tells the same story. So um, the government will release that so device figure within this week, um, in a couple of days, but, but latest observation is Q2 is 1.0% Q over Q uh, uh, growth in the real GDP. And annual rate is 4.0%. And if you look at more carefully, that's of what's con is a kind of driving force behind this. Uh, by, by the way, this is a six quarter consecutive quarter growth, positive growth in Japan. And I learned that from yesterday's dinner that so uh, Professor uh, Dreisdale told me that so your country continued to, to grow last 26 years, so which is not comparable, but six quarters is enormous for us. So this is the last time we see that so six consecutive quarter growth is 11 years ago. So, so that's the telling thing here. And if you see the component, well, because of the global economy becomes so recover, uh, that's half of the, uh, latter half of the, the last year, then you can see our export push up the real GDP growth like this, 0.4%, 0.6%, 0.3% point, pushing up the real GDP growth, okay? But after that, or subsequently, this feeds into the domestic side of the, the economy. Then you can see that so the private consumption here, it grows like 0.2 to 0.5, and non-residential investment 0.1 to 0.4. Something like that. So this growth is coming from not only the export or external sector, but also the domestic sector. And if you further pay attention, this public investment becomes a positive figure here. This is reflecting 
the, the last two years, last summer's huge so, stimulus package introduced by the Japanese government, there is a time lag here. So, so, so that means that so private demand, the private domestic demand has began to increase and the public investment <coughs> began to increase. And at the same time, we think that so this negative figure of the export is a kind of temporary phenomenon. Um, nowadays, that's so business intelligence re a unit of the Bank of Japan uh, report to me that so uh, Japanese, for instance, so electric parts manufacturers are quite busy to seeking their product for the sake of the new iPhone or this kind of thing. So I would expect this so export so number becomes positive in the near future. So all in all, these phenomena or these number or figure tells us that the so real side is very solid, okay? So that is the kind of thing. But if you look at the nominal side, as I mentioned at the outset, the story <coughs> could be different. The, the left-hand side panel is a core CPI measure, which is uh, CPI less fresh food. So that is our number. And uh, the latest reading of this core CPI measure is here, 0.5% uh, y, y, y over Y, okay? It is positive, but most of this 0.5% comes from this shaded part, that is energy. So rebound of the energy prices just contribute to the positive figures of the CPI here, okay? And if we subtract so this energy component, then right-hand side panel here, less fresh food and energy, then it hoover around 0%. So that's a kind of difficulty here, okay? And sometimes we think that so, well, nowadays that so our community, central bank community, is, well, three major economy is are just saying that so, inflation is becoming softer and softer and what the hell of this, something like this. But I would say that so, well, our country's situation is much more serious compared with our peers. This is a just comparison of, well, this is less food and energy, CPI inflation, uh, comparison between three major economy, Japan, Germany, and the US. But you can easily see that so, our CPI is stand out for the weakness, okay? And sometimes, well, we just think that so this might be somewhat affected by measurement problem. Uh, the housing length is very, very difficult to, to measure and especially owner-occupied housing rent is, well, notoriously difficult to, to measure. And the treatment of that measurement is quite different from country to country. So once upon a time, we saw that just excluding housing rent, just excluding one by one, and finally, we got to some similar thing. Um, once upon a time, we had a similar so inflation number if we excluded so, uh, this housing rent. But unfortunately, the recent reading of the inflation is saying that even excluding this housing rent, so we are by lag behind, so these peers, okay? And uh, I think this, uh, this picture is somewhat telling the current situation in the Japanese economy, in a sense. As you see that, so three central bank are here. These two guys, go ahead. And I don't know why my governor is laughing at, but, but somewhat behind these two economies. So, so that is a kind of situation which is so pictured by Jackson Hole at the Jackson Hole this year, okay? So this is a telling sense. And again, that's so we try to spot the, the, some idiosyncratic factors which might explain the current weakness of the CPI. And this is a similar story in the United States. Well, because of the budget smartphone is now in flux to, to Japan, so which pushed down the durable goods here. Um, the durable goods prices is coming down because of this mobile phone <coughs> component. This is nowadays more cheaper, so smartphone coming from the China, and that's explained here. And the right-hand side panel is communication, or the telecommunication fee, and this is, well, partly because of the government initiative, uh, try to, to, to slash the prices of the mobile phone, then it continued to, to push down the so our CPI measure here. But this is a kind of idiosyncratic factors, which we, the central banker, are quite good at so spotting, 
But this is not the entire story. We need to, to see more broad picture that why the P CPI is so weak, or pushing, paraphrasing like this way, why have wage and prices remained weak despite very tight labor market conditions? <coughs> so this is a kind of big picture which we want to ad I want to address. Okay, and I want to separate this issue that so wage component and price component one by one. Okay. Let me first tackle on the wage component, and afterwards we want to go to the, the price component. And this is a kind of confirmation of the way the problem he, he is here. Um, if you look at the left hand side, uh, the horizontal axis is uh, job so application, uh, job up vacancy to application rate or something like this. That means that so if you go to toward the right, then there is a labor shortage. And uh, we normalize that so this indicator. To, 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 to become that zero at the time of the year 1990. That is a long time ago. But it was a time that so we enjoyed the bubble era, so that's a crazy time for us, but labor shortage is, was really serious at that time. Which means that so the current observation of the 2017 Q1 is zero, or just above the zero, mean that so the current so labor tightness is just comparable with what we have experienced in the, the, bubble, the height of the bubble era. And if we try to change the, the indicator to unemployment rate or whatsoever you like, the picture is broadly the same. And on the, horizon, on the vertical axis, I take the so, uh, hourly so, uh, nominal wages. And at the height of the, the bubble era, we used to have the 5% increase of the wage, okay? But nowadays, we just have one point something. So this is a kind of question which we need to answer. Why on us, despite this very tight labor condition, why wage has not why? And uh, we think that so this is a kind of so, uh, well, liberation of the, the Japanese labor market so, um, structure. Uh, it's a kind of so dual labor market sense. You see that so while well, we Japanese labor market is, has a distinct feature that's so regular versus non-regular workers component. And if you look at the non-regular workers component, then as indicated by this so uh, light blue line on the right hand side panel, it is going up. The nominal wage of them is more than two percent or like three percent nowadays. Uh, so this is a kind of so thing that so we observe for the non-regular workers. And uh, even though I haven't brought that picture today, but um, um, we know from our economic exercise that so nominal wage of the nominal uh, non-regular workers is quite responsive to the labor market condition. And, uh, and we just estimate that relationship and try to extend, given that current condition of the labor market, how so non-regular workers wage looks like which is broadly in line with what we have seen here. So there is no question here that so non-regular workers' wage is coming up because of the very tight labor market condition, okay? But the story is totally different for the, this blue line or more, so uh, thick blue line here, which is regular workers' component, and especially regular payment of the regular workers. And uh, if I may add, so what is happening here, um, this is a kind of economics here. I just try to compare that, so again, three major economy, Germany, United States, and Japan, and try to, to estimate the so-called Phillips curve relationships, okay? Uh, if you look at the very small part of the right-hand side panel, then we try to estimate that so wage growth on the left-hand side equation, and on the right-hand side equation, we put something here, including the unemployment rate things, and also the inflation expectation or past inflation thing, or these kind of things. First, please look at the alpha two, which is a quotient on the unemployment rate. That means that so, how responsive nominal wage for the regular workers or the regular payment is, is, is alpha two is 0.045 for Japanese situation. And there is no asterisk here, meaning that so statistically speaking, which is, this is not uh, significant. So that means that so, 
regular workers regular payment is not responsive to the unemployment rate at all so that is a kind of stress here and which is contrary totally different from the German situation, which has a point, minus 0.5 so coefficient here. So this is totally different. And, and next, please look at one minus alpha one here. One minus alpha is alpha one is a coefficient on the past inflation rate, okay? In the case of Japan, which has a coefficient on 0.62 and three asterisks here, which is very significant, okay? 0.62 which is quite different from United States and Germany. So that means that so these guys have a kind of so wages of the regular workers is quite inflation inertia thing. So last observation of the inflation expand these guys if so wage goes and which is not responsive to the, the labor market condition. And uh, we think that so this is a situation because of the implicit long-term so nature of the labor contract between regular workers and management, okay? And uh, even though the current situation, very tight serious labor market condition, but the regular workers do not require wage hike to the management that's so in exchange of their job security in the future, okay? So that is a kind of long-term nature, implicit long-term nature of the, the, the the wage negotiation taking place in Japan. So uh, my answer to the why wages are so weak so far, given that so tight labor market condition, is if you go to the non-regular worker, there is nothing, okay? No, it is just going up, so there is no question here. But if you look at the regular workers' complaint, because of the, given that so dual labor market condition in Japan, uh, this guy's wage is still contained because of the long-term nature of the implicit labor contract, okay? And fortunately or unfortunately, this guy's wage is expanding 60%. Regular workers' regular payment is about 60% of the wage shares here in Japan, okay? So that's the first part. And the second part is, well, let me just go to, to, into this picture. Before going to the, this picture, let me introduce some anecdote here. Um, Given that very tight labor market condition, I asked that so the, the, the older branch in Japan, uh, the older branch of the Bank of Japan, we have 32 branch in, in office in Japan, and also the headquarters, uh, just collect the business intelligence information to me. And, and how that so Japanese firm <coughs> try to, to cope with the current labor market condition. So that's a question I pose to these guys, okay? There's a bunch of them report coming to, to my desk. And uh, I just try to, to, to categorize uh, this report to, to four groups. I mean, that the reaction coming in written in the report can be categorized with, into the four group, in a sense. The number one group is laser wage and laser prices, which is fantastic thing to, to see for us, isn't it? But uh, the prime example is Yamato Transportation. There's, is there any guy that knows the Yamato Unyu or this kind of company? Uh, Yamato Transportation is a dominant transportation company in Japan. And because of the very serious so, uh, shortage in drivers, uh, these guys decided to, to raise the wage for the drivers. And, and also at the same time, they decided to raise their fees for transportation fees against, for, the, for example, Amazon.co.jp or something like this, okay? And uh, I think this, this is, of course, we want to see this kind of reaction, okay? Uh, and I pose a question that, so how many people, how many farms in Japan just try to follow that, so Yamato transportation? And as I mentioned, that's a business intelligence unit, uh, gather the information and report to me that, so the answer is not many but very few, to be honest. Uh, what I have been reported is, well, transportation industry is because of the Yamato Transportation is such a dominant company. So even the small and the medium transportation company in the rural area just try to follow this dominant company. So there is some increase in the wage in drivers and also fee for the transportation. But that is quite exceptional. So that is what we observed. 
So that can be feed into the second subgroup, okay? Then second group is try to raise the investment for the labor saving. So CapEx, capital expenditure. And nowadays, that's so Japanese firm are very keen on expanding the capital investment uh, just for the sake of saving the, the labor shortage or labors there. If you go to the rural area in Japan, that's so you can easily pop into the supermarket, then you can find that so self so cash registration register or these kind of things now become more and more popular, even in the rural area in Japan. And likewise, that's so. Uh, one by one, these companies try to, to, to expand or introduce some capital investment and in order to, 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 well, in order to, to save the labor force here. And nowadays, that's so, our Tankan survey uh, shows us that so, this fiscal year's business in investment is planned, by, planned to increase by 6% annually against that so 1.5 is in last year's observation. And we think that so part of the explanation of this so increase in the, the investment is coming from this labor saving things. So that is a number two category. And the number three category is just reconsider that so business process. This is a number three thing. Um, um, again, that's so example here is for instance, that's a, it used to be the case that so Japanese fast food restaurant operate 24 hours per day. Uh, and, but you, if you think that so, well, if you want to have a rice bowl or beef bowl or something like that, uh, whether you want to have it in the two o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the morning, <laughs> how many people do like to have it? But fortunately, unfortunately, these guys compete each other and try to open the, the operation 24 hours, okay? But given that so the labor shortage here, they just began to think whether this is a viable option. And some of the fast food restaurants ceased to the, the rest, well, stop, they shut down the, the restaurant about the time of the 10 o'clock in the evening, which is, I think it's healthy, okay? <laughs> and also that's, so again, let me trans, uh, so pick up the Yamato transportation again. These guys are thinking that so the same day delivery is quite costly for the driver's things, okay? And they cease to, to, to doing it or just try to levy extra fee on same day delivery, which makes sense for me again, okay? This kind of, so business, so practice reconsideration is one by one uh, try to, 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 to do something for the, against the, 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 the labor shortage. But let me just ask one question that, how many people know that so <coughs> Japanese word of omotenashi here? So some people, and please let me know that's so how to translate into English. <laughs> so that's the next question. I have always difficulty to, 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 to how to translate this omotenashi in, 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 in Japanese. Hospitality could be, and courtesy or goodwill service or that sort of thing. But bottom line here, in order to show our hospitality, courtesy, goodwill, we Japanese service sector provide extra service without fee. So that's the sense of the motenashi, okay? And nowadays, these guys are thinking about whether they can continue this motenashi things uh, given this labor shortage here. Or otherwise, they want to, to, to charge something, okay? And a similar story can be heard in the workplace as well. Um, these days, that's so, the Japanese farms are quite keen on raising the retention rate of the female workers. And uh, these guys really want to, to, to retain the female workers in the office to the extent possible. And, uh, and in order to, well, because of the retention rate drop, because of the childbearing or this kind of thing, okay? Mm -hmm. And of course, that's so many Japanese farms uh, give the option to the female worker, you can quit, the, leave the office short, with a shorter working hours, say four o'clock in the afternoon or five o'clock in the afternoon, you can leave the office and just go back to your home. So that kind of thing is quite popular in Japan. But, some farms find that so, even they give that this kind of so 
opportunity to female worker. This is <coughs> Japan, okay? So these female or ladies quit the job without taking this option. The reason here is these female workers feel guilty because she leave the office and her so colleagues is in the office until the time of the midnight or 10 o'clock. They feel some guilt here, okay? And we want to promote these ladies to the higher level. Again, they decline to that sort of so promotion because they understand that so if they are promoted to the higher level, the older manager stay in the office until 10 midnight, something like this. We cannot continue it. So that's a kind of reaction. And the president of some company is all of a sudden think that, so, hey, this is a serious problem. You guys need to leave the office. Hold the, the employee here, need to leave the office by the time of 7 o'clock. You guys leave here, okay? The reaction coming from the floor is, of course, this is crazy. And, uh, and uh, I can easily so have sympathy with that sort of thing. Uh, but but um, um, well, these guys have barely managed the, the operation by staying in the office 10 o'clock or midnight or something like this. But all of a sudden, the president is saying that, so, hey, you need to go back to your home, home by the time of the school. But again, this is a kind of Japanese situation that if these guys are forced to, to leave the office, then individual workers just rethink their business process and try to, 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 to get rid of one by one most unnecessary part of their business. And after all, this president find out that their sales never drop, even with this shorter time horizon, okay? And uh, presumably, thrust of the third story and second story is similar, to be honest. They are raising the labor productivity in Japan in either way, capital expenditure or just reconsidering their business process. And one by one, these kind of things, so laser labor productivity in Japan. And if I may add a fourth reaction, is these guys do not do anything and complain about the BOJ, and uh, that's it. But let's forget about this fourth category. <laughs> so, and well, my point here is second and third, is raising the productivity here. And uh, let me recap that, so, that sort of anecdote here on the right-hand panel here. As I mentioned, that Japanese firms contain the, the increase of the wages by regular workers' component or regular work payment of the regular workers' component. So as a consequence, real wage is moving sideways or increase a little bit, okay? That is what is happening on the real wage side. But if you look at the labor productivity, it has going up like this, okay? So this is the kind of thing what is happening here. Then if you see that so the gap between these two measures, uh, which is plotted as a real wage gap here, then because the labor productivity is going up and the real wage is just moving sideways, it goes down like this. And the real wage gap is just a well, we made uh, this kind of terminology here, but you can easily translate it as a kind of unit labor cost. Or if you are mo much more familiar with uh, economics, which is labor share of income. So nothing but that. So it comes like, down like this. And this exerts downward pressure on the prices, which we try to do to, to, to find out. Well, in the rigorous academic sense, this exercise has a, a lot of reservation, I must admit it. But we just plug this real wage gap sense into the usual flex curve relationships. Then, well, if you look at the right-hand side of the it's a small letters here. But left-hand side equation is inflation itself, okay? And right-hand side equation is, uh, again, inflation expectation and past inflation. And Y gap is a output gap, and W gap is this wage gap, okay? And uh, we estimate it here, beta 3 is a quotient on that, which is marginally significant and has a quotient on 0.05, and which exert the downward pressure which is shaded by dark things here, 
which is pushed down the, the real uh, the, the CPI inflation by 0.2 or 0.3 percent point these days. And whether this is a big number or small number, it is, I mean, arguable things. And we spend a lot of time in the Bank of Japan, whether this is too much or too small or something like that. But instead of going to that sort of so technical details, I wanted to raise another technical thing here. Um, well, um, if you are not so economics major, this is something that so we economists tend to think in a stu stupid way, <laughs> I don't know. And for the economists, that's so this is economics 101. Um, I just draw that so, well, this horizontal axis is red line. Vertical axis is capital in input, okay? And, uh, and this culture here is a production function. So the same amount of output is created by combination of the labor input and the capital in investment, okay? And uh, we just plotted it here, okay? And presumably, at the outset, we might be in the position of the E1. And because of the substitution from the labor to the capital, which might shift to the E2, <coughs> So E2, that, so you can see that so labor input becomes smaller and the capital so input becomes larger. That means that substitution between that so labor to the capital things, okay? And uh, that is a kind of one situation which might describe the current situation, which is presumably uh, related with my second anecdote, more capital investment, okay? But I might argue that so third anecdote might be too, a little bit different from this situation. Um, just reconsidering the business process could be a kind of innovation or technological progress. That is another terminology which we, the, the economists, try to, to use. On the right hand panel, I shifted the coefficient of the A, which is a kind of technological progress things. Then entire curve or the, the isocont curve Shift it to blue line to, to the right one, uh, the red one. Then if you see that so E2 to E3, again, labor is so smaller, and the same amount of the output is created by this shifting the, the culture, then labor productivity has increased. So my story here is in economics time, we might be able to see that so a hike in the labor productivity either coming from the substitution story or technological progress story. Why we are bothered about this kind of complicated story, which is presumably for non-economist people that so it's a crazy thing. But this has a quite important so implication for us. Uh, in the case of the, 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 the substitutions, well, I might say that so both have happening in Japan, okay? But we ask which one is more dominant. That is the kind of question which we have. And if that so left-hand side panel is really dominant, and labor is really substituted to, to the, 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 the capital investment or capital itself, then with a certain condition, then um, the, with certain condition, the real wage gap, which I introduced before, declined like this. And this decline is permanent. And in the case of the right hand side of the technology progress, well, sometime in the future, real wage should catch up high, higher labor productivity. That means that so this real wage gap going back to the original position. So that is the kind of things. And uh, whether that's so, this kind of situation is happening or not has a, of course, from our point of view, has a very, very serious implication here, which is dominant, okay? And uh, to be honest, that so these days, that so uh, the labor income share is so coming down, not only in Japan, but also other countries as well. And if you look at, if you read at the chapter three of the, the April World Economic Outlook created by the fund economists, they argue that so, the, uh, because of the substitution, that so labor share income is going coming down like this. But we are arguing that it might not be the case. 
if we do this kind of estimation of the substitution coefficient here, well, I don't go want to go to the de detail here, but this sigma coefficient is a substitution thing. And if this sigma is beyond the one, then that means that so this is a certain condition which economists attach to the, 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 the substitution, given the substitution, uh, substitution and labor share income is declined with certain condition. That certain condition is this substitution coefficient become more than one. Uh, that is in more plain English that so if this substitution is really enormous, then labor is forced to, to substitute by capital, then there is no compensation for the labors. That's the kind of storyline here, okay? But if we estimate the sigma on the left-hand side uh, panel, then sigma never becomes one, okay? If we just receive the IT things, then it becomes one, could be one, but it's just only for the manufacturing sector. So after doing this kind of exercise, we think that presumably substitution between labor and capital is never beyond one. So, so that means that so from our point of view, the Buge's point of view, the labor, wa the real wage gap should come up somewhere in the future. That means that so this kind of so downward phenomenon, price pressure, is uh, sort of temporary phenomenon rather than permanent. So that's the kind of things, okay? And having said so, the presumably uh, raising the labor productivity is not important, not only for the central banker, but also the Japanese economy as a whole. And this is a kind of so long-term so uh, gross uh, picture in Japan. That so we used to have in the 1970s, that's four or five percent growth there, and uh, which is coming from that so labor productivity, which is uh, this uh, uh, area in, with, a, uh, with a line, okay? But which declined like this 1% or something like that as the economy matured, okay? And if you look at the, the white, uh, the, the shaded part, this number of workers, uh, as you know that so, this is why well, we have a very negative so demographic factor here. Presumably in 20 or 30 years, this shaded area becomes minus one or something like that. Okay, and in order to prevent our economy from shrinking, then labor productivity should be based as such. So for us, so raising the labor productivity is enormously important. And whether we can do it or not, presumably we might be able to do that. Uh, that is a kind of a final picture which I want to introduce. This is a kind of, well, measuring the labor productivity is very difficult to be honest. And, uh, and uh, the Professor Jorgensen at the MIT is a kind of, so, well, I don't know, the world-leading economist who really want to, to measure any kind of labor productivity or any kind of country. So, so this is a kind of so figure which I trust most, okay? And these guys just try to, 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 to measure the labor productivity in Japan and compare them with the United States. And this so picture is saying that the so United States is one. And the, the last observation here, Japan's labor productivity, their labor productivity is 0.6, mean that so we are just 60% of the United States labor productivity. Of course, there is a lot of argument here, measurement problem, et cetera, et cetera. But as I mentioned, that so this is a world of so leading figures is so uh, creating this number, okay? So there is ample room for us to, to further raise the labor productivity. So that's the kind of thing here. Well, presumably, we might need to, to reconsider further that so whether we need to continue the modernization or this kind of thing. Um, but presumably, uh, one by one, we might be able to, 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 to raise that so, uh, productivity in Japan. So let me just sum up my story today. Um, first. Um, solid economic recovery is taking place in Japan, and relatively strong real growth can be expected for the time being. That is the number one part, okay? Number two part is, despite the solid recovery, price remains weak, and the higher productivity and slower wage increase of regular workers 
could be one reason behind this weakness. So that is a number two. And the number three is as long as productivity is increasing, we can expect price will start to increase at some point of time. I don't know when, but at some point of time. On that score, that's so um, the, the, this downward pressure is temporary phenomena, uh, which we, central banker, can accommodate. So that is uh, number three. Mm -hmm. And the number four, uh, tight labor market condition, together with presumably improvement of the government growth strategy, uh, may become a good catalysis to the uh, raising productivity uh, in Japan. Because that's so, as I mentioned, that's so, as an anecdote, that's so, well, the, what is really trigger that so, the Japanese farm to raise the productivity is, of course, that's so, some sort of so, implementation of the labor market reform or this kind of thing by government, but also importantly, labor shortage itself is really push hard this guy to further raise the productivity, isn't it? So that means that so, well, I would say that so, the labor shortage, or in our jargon, uh, the Janet Yellen of the Fed chairwoman is nowadays saying that so-called high pressure economy is a kind of word which we use. Uh, high pressure economy itself might raise the labor productivity in Japan. So uh, if we continue the current high pressure economy, it could be the case that we can have new economy of Japan, which is characterized by higher labor productivity and also hopefully by higher inflation. That's the story of my mind. So, okay, thank, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much for insightful presentations. Your productivity story reminds me that the days around the 2000, in your figures, you know, it was a low productivity days. We worked uh, always uh, from 9 a.m. to 12 midnight, I think. So that I think at that time our productivity was low, very low, and I think uh, we did uh, too much or too many omotenashi within the Bank of Japan. So, <laughs> yeah, so that, okay, so that we have uh, still 10, or 10 to 15 minutes to have uh, questions. And so that this is a great opportunity to ask the questions to the chief economist of the Bank of Japan. So if you have any question, please raise your hands. Yeah, first. Could you tell your name first? Um, Bronwyn Evans, CEO of Standards Australia and member of the Australia Japan Foundation. Dr. Sekine, I was um, struck by your comment that even in spite of um, a tight labour market, one reason for the low wage growth was probably people still valuing job security and staying in jobs a long time. In Australia, we're seeing young people want to stay in a job for 18 months or two years and change and perhaps have 11 jobs in a lifetime. Is that trend starting to emerge in Japan? Well, presumably not many. So still that's so, uh, well, the Japanese youngsters, well, some of the Japanese youngsters try to, 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 to uh, go to the venture business or this kind of things. But I would say that so, well, if you look at the, 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 the young graduate, uh, from the esteemed university, uh, most of the guys wanted to, to secure their job in the big farms. So, and, uh, and that's the reason why small and medium enterprise these days have particular difficulty in hiring that so, uh, employees or young staff there. So on that score, that's, uh, there is not much significant change taking place as yet. But as, if I may add one thing here, a uh, distinction between regular and non-regular workers uh, is presumably becoming a little bit more blurred in a sense uh, because of the, I mean, serious labor shortage. Uh, some of the Japanese farms tend to provide or try, try to, to change the status of the non-regular workers to regular workers to give some sort of job security there and just try to attract this so, uh, temporary staff. To, to, to their company. So, and uh, also that so government initiative of the same wage, same work, same job, is a kind of so initiative which might so uh, uh, change the structure of the, this dual labor market to regular versus non-regular, because same wage for the same job, okay? So, so that might intrigue in the future 
further shift in the labor market condition, but, but I, we haven't seen much as yet. Is it okay? Yeah, okay, so the, any, any more other questions? Yeah, please. Greg Chang from Griffith University. I'll, I'll try. Uh, I'm not an economist, so hopefully I'm not going to stay out of uh, my area too much. Uh, look, given you're talking about the, the problem of weight weakness and, and price weakness, um, does that sort of um, impact on, in a sense, deferred consumption and also savings, like the percentage of savings as part of wage? Uh, wait, as a part of wage, and also, has there any, been an impact on the pension or Lincoln system as well? Uh, that's a good question, I must say. Um, well, I tend to think that so. In a more, well, it's a kind of so consequence and a kind of cause could be, isn't it? So, so this is a kind of a general equilibrium thing. That so. We need to, to sort out everything at the same time. Uh, with, it could be the case of the uncertainty of the, the pension or this kind of thing in the future, which might feed into the higher saving in the household sector, which might account for some weakness in the, the, the CPI or wage or these kind of things. And uh, again, that's so. Well, that might be causality here. And, uh, and, uh, and of course, that's so given that so this weak development or softness in the, the, the nominal side, presumably uh, the pension fund's budget itself is becoming more shaky in a sense, other than inflation is really high flying because of the interest rate is so low. So, so if you put that thing in the picture, then presumably there's a lot of things taking place and uh, there must be some cause and consequence here. So that is my uh, answer to, to, to your question. Yeah. Uh, Murray McLean, um, I wanted to ask you uh, about external factors on the economy, in particular um, the growth in tourism from China uh, at least a year ago, certainly maybe it's receded a little bit the impact of that seemed to be quite significant um, uh, on consumption and retail patterns and that sort of thing. Um, and also, I think you did talk about trade flows, but just so perhaps on the services side that would be interesting. Yes, uh, well, it is another government initiative that so far that try to attract that foreign tourists to Japan. And presumably, uh, we have already observed that a lot of so, people coming to Japan especially from China. And, uh, and that trend is um, presumably continuing still. Uh, so if you look at the more latest figure, then you can easily see that so uh, uh, Chinese so tourists coming in Japan still and, and, uh, and grab a lot of so things in Japan. And uh, our expectation here is presumably around the time of the Tokyo Olympic, which is planned in 2020, uh, presumably, tourists is coming up so so on that so trend, and uh, and this is a really important thing that so um, um, presumably these kind of things is try to modernize the service sector in Japan uh, because <coughs> these guys well, think about it so ryokan or hotel in Japan and so these guys want to try to attract the foreign tourists to to there then they try to go to the internet business and try to attract more foreign tourists coming to, 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 to this Japanese old style hotel or something like that. That could create so more incentive for them to, to, to raise the labor productivity. And, uh, and I have, again, that's, so this is a kind of anecdotal story that so, I have, have a report that so, uh, the older can in Japan try to attract more tourists by innovating or stepping this IT things, which was not, in fact, on, still not in, in most of the Japanese yokan. But this young so yokan owner uh, is good at computer or this kind of thing. They all of a sudden try to expand this thing. Their labor productivity become triple as such. So this is a good example why we can expect something from that. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Uh, Veronica Taylor, uh, ANU. Uh, thanks, Dr. Sekimir, for a really uh, terrific presentation. I was um, interested that you didn't mention um, any modelling on the possible effects of migration. And I wonder whether that's because you think labour migration is not a solution to the problems that you're sketching, or whether it's still too politically sensitive. It's a topic that we uh, discuss annually at the Japan Update, so I'm interested in your views. Um, well, let me, um, well, presumably so this immigration or migrant thing is presumably more political so thing that so which should be discussed by the politicians. Uh, but having said so, uh, what is happening in Japan is, well, there is, well, first of all, government welcome the high skilled labor, uh, even from the foreign country. That's their doing. And at the same time, you can easily see that so <coughs> foreign workers has already uh, more than a million in Japan. That is the government statistics. Okay, and it is increasing. And uh, one thing which so I was surprised this summertime that so I went to the Maebashi. Maebashi is you know the Maebashi. I don't know. Uh, it's a rural area. Okay, and uh, and with my son and uh, and uh, and I stepped in the Magnano there, and uh, and I knew beforehand these day that so uh, workers in Magnano is a lot of workers is foreign. So, uh, people, and I, I can easily see that the so name tag here is not a Japanese at all, and their Japanese is not fluent as a native Japanese tongue. Okay, but at the same time, what is surprising for me is not only the worker, but also the customers are foreigner as well, so even in the rural area in my machine. It's a not sightseeing spot at all. That means that so these guys are labor there working for something there. So that means that so, well, presumably government statistics just cover this kind of thing, but presumably on the marginal sense, Japanese firms are, have already utilized that labor. So that is presumably what is happening in Japan. Okay, yeah, Manuel. Well, Benajir, Top of this, Hi, Toshi. How are you? Hi. <laughs> First of all, thank you for sharing with us a very rigorous and good contribution to this argument, which is very important for most economies, including Australia. I have a question related to two of your graphs. One is that uh, productivity in Japan has been growing quite well in the last couple of years, but at the same time, compared with US productivity, it still remains fairly flat and unchanged. Can you give me a sense of what you think Japan needs to do to close that gap even further, like it was in the late 80s? Well, the gap between the United States and Japan is um, mostly coming from the service sector. That is uh, the, what uh, Professor Jorgensen uh, is trying to, to spot. But even though that is, uh, there is no so that figure in my picture here, um, but but when the professor came to Japan and uh, and uh, I just so met him at the, the conference in in this summer, and he explicitly mentioned that so this is almost coming from the non-manufacturing sectors. That means that so presumably, uh, omotenashi story is somewhere here. So uh, well, if you people are coming to Japan and expect openness, then this is a disappointment story. But having said so, we need to, to, to change something for you guys coming to, to, uh, from our road. So, so that is the story here. And, uh, and, uh, and presumably that is the one thing. But having said so, um, the, the, your question is how we're gonna do it is a kind of question. My answer is, I have tried to, to mention it, but lack of the time here. Um, I wanted to see that, so, of course, that's so, uh, more growth strategy here, uh, and the government is really doing it uh, under the, the Sada law of the Abenomics, and, uh, and uh, this is a kind of labor market reform which is so initiated by uh, the, the current government. And their, their implementation, implementation is very important. Like that, so the same job, same wage, or something like this, okay? But 
I would like to, to emphasize here that so the the company's voluntary reaction or response to the labor shortage is also quite important. And that means that so uh, as I mentioned at the very last part of the, my so speech, that so if we can continue this high pressure economy, then that means that so labor shortage becomes more and more serious. Then more and more firms in Japan try to raise the labor productivity uh, without any sort of so forceful, I mean, government <coughs> force or something like that. So they are voluntarily trying to, to, to create some sort of innovation uh, to further raise the, the, the labor productivity. And uh, as I mentioned, that might come from the service sector. Okay, so we may have more questions, but the time is uh, running up. So that, you know, we would like to close the session. So if you have any question, you know, please talk to Toshi over the lunch or something. So that, please join me thanking for Toshi for the fantastic yeah. presentation. <laughs>